So today, you know, sit down, guys. Let's start. Let's start. Let's start. So today we're going to um, uh, talk about the English landscape garden, um, and the English landscape garden uh, in particular. Obviously, we've already been talking about the. Uh, you know, we've been going through this sort of first the first uh, lesson where I talked to you about the. Um, the sort of way that the zero point works, and I also introduced some of the English landscape garden to you in relationship to Australia, if you remember when I talked about how the um, English uh, settlers uh, turned up to um, Australia and were surprised that the landscape looked as similar to the English landscape at the time as um, uh, as it uh, as it was, and that they, maybe that played some sort of factor in the um, uh, maybe that played some sort of factor in the fact that it's, that uh, the English were so entranced by Australia. And as I said, those techniques that Aboriginal people used to manage the landscape resembled those techniques that the English landscape gardeners were using. And so, if we want to put the English landscape garden in context of the periods that we talked about afterwards, which was the sort of the Italian and the French, you know, the general sort of zero point landscape history goes primeval, you know, uh, classical Italian and then uh, the Baroque and then the English. But as we've noticed all the way through, in the Italian and also in the Baroque, there are still these aspects of um, the qualities that became known as the uh, um, English landscape garden. Uh, it's often regarded as a, you know, interestingly, as an indigenous, um, you know, people who talk about it call this an indigenous landscape tradition of England. Um, but the transition is actually, as we talked about in relationship to the French Baroque landscape, the transition is actually not as smooth because the English uh, landscape garden was also a... Um, a version of the Baroque in a way when it started. And so what we might do is I'll talk about a few projects and I'll go over and talk about some of the important theory associated with the English landscape. Um, but one of the main things to notice is that it was highly theoretical. And so when we're talking about it being highly theoretical, one of the main aspects that we're probably talking about is around aesthetic theory. And so... That's a bit further down my dialogue, but I'll, I'll, uh, I'll return to it in a, in a moment. Um, the period we're talking about for the English landscape garden is really the end of the 17th century um, and into the, the sort of end of the 18th century, roughly. It's in that 100-year sort of period. And, and the writer Alexander Pope who sort of wrote in the period that overlapped it, talked about um, this landscape in terms of this uh, point, that this is from Jellico, that Pope said, um, he gains all points who pleasingly confounds, surprises, varies and conceals the bounds. And so what they're talking about with this idea is that, that th when they talk about confounding and surprising and variation, these are some of the key terms that come around the... English landscape garden, and then the idea of concealing boundary. And so we'll talk about this a lot further, but essentially, like the Japanese garden, which I'll also talk to you about in another, another session, both of these were landscape styles that were about appropriating the larger landscape, which is something you could also say about the villa garden. And so whichever way we want to talk about these are tropes of landscape architecture, which is that this is the landscape you might own, but in actual fact, the visual landscape is much larger. And that's, the, that's also part of the kind of colonial view that we're located at here, which is situated on the hill overlooking that, the whole landscape of, of the flats and across to the mountains. So in terms of the, of the main sort of um, things that Pope was talking about, he really saw... Oh, no, Walpole, pardon me. This is Horace Walpole, another guy who's quite important. Um, he talked about the, the sort of main parts of it as the ornamental farm, which is obviously about changing the utilitarian, the utilitarian landscape of the farm to become an aesthetic landscape. 
using a sort of a, um, a forest garden, which is, or a savage garden, which is the term he used, or more precisely the picturesque, which is the landscape of the painter, which we're going to talk about more. Um, and then also the garden which connects to the park. And so if we can imagine a sort of a, a transition, we're talking about the farm, then the, the, the park, which is also the forest, and then we're talking about a gar the garden, which is a transition between the building and um, the park. So obviously this is something we also talked about last week in relationship to Courant's where the garden is mediating between the park and the, and the house. Obvious, a lot of the time, that garden that was close to the house was also called the, the pleasure ground. Um, and so that's the rough schema. You know, broader landscape, which is the, the ornamental farm, the forest, or the rough kind of picturesque garden, and then the garden that, can see, that joins them. So if we talk about this, this project first, which is one that a lot of people... Um, sort of talk about at the start of this transition between the Baroque landscape and the landscape of uh, um, the English landscape, uh, really what we're looking at is th this project that I would talk about is, the, is what's known as, the, as um, Castle Howard. It's really in Yorkshire up towards Scotland and it's, a, it's quite an interesting, it's, it's quite a sort of magnificent um, thing it's designed by John Vanbrugh, and so a lot of the the landscape that that uh, was being designed at this time, in the same way that we noted that La Note was not actually well, La Note was a gardener, the landscape architect at the, that did not exist. Vanbrugh and a lot of the people of this period were, you know, gentlemen, and you know, gentlemen, you know, insofar as that were they were, it was all about travel, going the grant to the Grand Tour. And looking at uh, um, looking at places like um, Hadrian's villa and trying to bring across some of those those kind of things, and so uh, what um, what Vanbrugh did he he did in fact um, you know the point that again Walpole said about him when talking about Castle Howard was nobody had informed me that a view, that one view I would see a palace a town, a fortified city, temples on, a high, on high places, works worthy of being each a metropolis of the Druids, the noblest lawn in the world, fenced by half the horizon, and a mausoleum that would tempt one to be buried alive. And so the main point that the Jellicoes make, which I think is a good one, is around theatre, that the landscape was, in a sense, theatrical, and the design was theatrical. And so... Um, the, that that theatre can be demonstrated, you know, quite comfortably in this sort of processional route that one takes to arrive at um, Castle Howard. And these are photos from when I I visited it in my grand tour, where one moves on has this long entry road, moving through uh, that sort of straight line through a series of kind of gateways and portals, each of which has a kind of like a a different sort of um, motif, whether it be a sort of a, a pyramidal structure, etc., an, an obelisk, all of these series of points along this straight road till one arrives at this axis, this cross axis, to get into the, you know, to enter the garden, you know, entry gates. So you get a sense of how how continuous that that sort of series of transitions and how theatrical they are. And so in the, the garden design itself, you can see the earliest, you know, some of the earliest patterns of, of Castle Howard here were quite, you know, in a sense, they're quite sort of Baroque in how they're organised. You can see the main transverse axis, um, the, the, the house situated in relationship to that geometry. And so the sort of form of it is quite clear in a lot of respects uh, in terms of the that sort of Baroque orientation. But over time, um, the landscape, you know, changed and in actual fact, uh, a sort of a number of things that we might recognise as being characteristic of the English landscape occur. So that, for example, in front of the house that was designed by Van Brown, this is actually, I should say, behind the house, we did still have the parterre, 
And then on the other side of the house, we have this huge lawn that this is a panorama. So this huge lawn in front of the building with no garden in front of it, just the lawn moving out to a large created, you know, created lake that you can see. And across the landscape were also a series of different um, follies. And so in a lot of the sense, it was an architectural, an architectural landscape. And so the, the, the relationship to some of those um, uh, sort of elements from the Italian garden can be seen here. You know, in this sort of, this is the sort of the temple of the, the four winds, which was a variation of, you could say, the Villa Rotunda by Palladio. And so, you know, effectively, in a colonial kind of way, you know, Vanbrugh goes to Europe, appropriates the Italian architecture, and then situates it in this landscape. And you can see that transition from, from this sort of ornamental landscape into the sort of um, <clears throat> the landscape of the larger ornamental farm. You know, this bridge here, you'll see also that we saw last week at the at Vola Vicomte as well, towards the transition of the boundary. So there's some similarity there between the two. Um, you know, obviously, if we go back to this sort of overarching description, you can see the relationship between the, this sort of earlier sort of Baroque structure close to the house and then the organisation of the landscape with that sort of lake beyond. And so it's an early, an early kind of thing. And so the transition can also be played out in a number of works by other landscape architects who are, or garden designers who are working in that period. And so Charles Bridgman, I suppose if we were trying to think of a few, a, a sort of a sequence, the sequence we would probably be looking at is this guy, Charles Bridgman. And Charles Bridgman's really working on the... You guys all right? What's going on? All good? Yeah? Okay, good. Charles Bridgman um, was really on the kind of Baroque end of the, the English landscape movement. William Kent is really follows him and really brings in the establishes a lot of the, the innovations that we know by um, of the English landscape garden. Then we have its sort of professionalization by um, Lancelot Capability Brown. And then we have the, mimic the sort of mimicry of Capability Brown, which is by Humphrey Repton. So Bridgman, Kent, Brown, Repton, that's the sort of standard sort of way of describing it. So we look at, this is a very famous project called um, Stowe, and Stowe was important um, because of the fact that it was a, um, it was really, uh, I think it's, it was it's tied to a sort of political changes that were, that were happening in the, um, the, the period, and, and also because a whole lot of people worked on it, starting with Bridgman going on to Kent and then going on to Capability Brown, all three of them. And so... <clears throat> Um, the, the, it was designed for um, Lord Cobham and he was a sort of what's known as a, a Whig philosopher and he was a liberal, a, you know, when we think about liberalism now, it's interesting because, you know, liberalism sort of never had a worse, you know, it's never been a, had, there's never been a worse time for liberalism than there is now probably in the world because... It's seen as highly hypocritical because, on the one hand, it espouses social values that are very um, open, and on the other hand, it's tied to capitalism, which actually would seem to be working against those values. And so, you have that situation where the left regards liberalism as as um, gutless, gutless would be socialists. The right regards liberals as, you know. Um, also gutless socialists who are not really socialists and are just wrong. Whereas at least at either end, the socialists and the, and the right could see each other as sort of direct opposites. And so liberalism, though, as a history in the UK um, was tied to this, this, this political movement called the Whigs, W-H-I-G. And <clears throat> the Whigs uh, were, um, as I say, liberal in their views, and so they were... Um, you know, abolitionists in terms of they were anti-slavery, um, etc. They were into the you know the values of man, etc., etc. Humanism, but at the same time they were also, for instance, 
they were, it's the later on, the Whigs that developed industrialization. And so you could also look at the fact that during industrialization there were really terrible things happening to people in terms of child labor, etc. So on the one hand, they were politically liberal, but economically they were still tied to exploitative means of production. But that's a bit later, and that's when you end up with people like, uh, you know, Darwin's family, uh, Charles Darwin's family in that sort of Whig tradition. But, St but Stowe, um, when Bridgman started to work on it, you can start to see here a lot of the, the aspects of Stowe that are kind of like a bit like a miniature a bit like a miniature Versailles in terms of the way that the axialities um, operate in terms of the patois um, of the, the goose foot in the park and the relationship between the park and the garden and these large axial geometries with the house in the centre of the, the terrace and the garden. But you can also pick up amongst the park these kind of, you know, amorphous geometries or these variations to use the kind of variability to use the language of um, of the uh, the picturesque and so on the one hand Bridgman you know was involved in setting up you know that basic drawing and that basic structure and here's a drawing by Bridgman uh, uh, you know apparently by Bridgman although it's very hard to find these kind of drawings in reality but you can see here that axis leading to the hexagonal pool, another axis leading across to here, and we can see all that axiality, etc. Now, um, Bridgman, uh, you know, also undertook something which was very important and he became known for, which was the creation of the ha-ha. Do you guys know what a ha-ha is? What's a ha-ha? So a ha-ha is, is basically like putting a fence in a ditch. And so the way the ha-ha worked... I don't know if I have a picture of one here, but the way a ha-ha works is that it's literally like if you can imagine in section or we're looking out across a lawn, then the ground drops down with a wall. At the base of the wall, there is a fence, and then the ground comes back up. Or there doesn't even have to be a fence. There might just be a wall, actually, classically. So the sheep can't get into the garden because if they walk along, it basically graduates down to this wall. And so from one side you look across no wall and then therefore the whole landscape seems to be open. The other side there's a deterrent to stop the, uh, to stop the, stop the game coming in. And so this was an invention allegedly of Bridgman's and in actual fact um, the famous term that's used by... Um, uh, that's used... Well in actual fact apparently jointly it's, it's by Kent and Bridgman and that Pope says, you know, that, that they invented the ha-ha or the sunk ditch and thus leapt the fence and saw that all nature was a garden. And so this is where we should also remember this transition and the relationship between the second and third nature, right? So this is sort of we're still in that zone. So we look at the transition. So we, on the one hand, you know, we have a series of, you know, we have some sort of key parts of the development of the garden, you can start to see how the transition is occurring in that garden insofar as there is obviously some earlier geometry coming in, but then there's a process of this sort of this Baroque structure and then there's a sort of breaking down and changing of that structure. And then by the time Kent comes in, all of the axiality and the patois are gone the lake has been converted from being a hexagon in, and to entirely being naturalised, and then these sort of water tributaries have been increased until they have become a kind of like a, like Brown's time, a sort of an entirely sort of naturalised or, you know, inverted commas, naturalised sort of landscape, you know. And so um, <clears throat> if we look at the kind of key the key sort of parts of the landscape, we can see that each time, this is something that, that I was very interested in, uh, that is that there's a kind of, each space has some sort of architectural object in it that has a visual link across to another space. And so essentially you're composing the view and obviously with the English landscape garden, you know, the view is, is hugely important. It's important uh, obviously in the in the French garden, but there's some sense that the French 
um, interest in the, vi the optical was, was to some extent a bit more related to the use of perspective and foreshortening, etc., whereas the view in the English landscape was largely about movement. And a lot of that movement was around association. So there's a guy called Edward Harwood who wrote, writes about the role of association in the English landscape garden and the way that effectively moving through the garden was about moving from one part of a story to another part of a story, etc. And so each time the landscape is kind of shaped with some topography, often with a water body, with a piece of, of architecture which is more, than, more often than not a folly, that one walks or moves towards that object and then at that object another vista is moved up, is, is, is in a way curved towards. So you're walking towards one, then a, an angle is opened up at a distance. And so you can kind of see in each of these situations what I'm kind of doing is sort of walking towards one object and then another object will, opens up. And each time we can see this sort of characteristic relationship between the sort of architectural object which is sort of on the edge of the frame and then a, a, a sort of vegetated, a vegetated buffer that sets up the edges of that space, the use of a lawn opening onto a water body. And again, further on, we see the extent so that, that so for example, there's another view from one object or one architectural object or folly looking across the water and across this edged in by, by trees to, an, to this bridge. And so over and over you see these transitions, you know, where one might move to see this object and then find this object in the view and there's another one over here. And so you're sort of moving your way around these different objects and each one has a catchment that's shaped by trees and by changes. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it's it's very much very much a kind of you know if you look at the kind of list of them, there's you know Co Queen's Temple, Gothic Temple, Elysian Fields, Seasons Fountains, Cook Monument, da 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 da, Shell Bridge. So they're all objects, architectural objects set within a landscape, and a lot of them have a relationship to the um, uh, a lot of them have a relationship to the um, things like the Elysian Fields um, and things like Ovid. Again, so it's, it's part, as I mentioned before, a lot of the time we have a process where the, um, the modernity is seen as the taste for the old and education. So on the one hand, we have, this is a period where we have science emerging and all these things, but still it's about, it's, it's, it's good taste is about how you bring in those aspects of education and taste from the classical. I mean, that's still the main thing that's happening at the time, yeah. Uh, this is also the name that you mentioned that writes a lot about science. Well, no, that, that they're drawing from is Ovid. No, you, said it, you said it a while ago. Oh, yeah, a guy called, called Edward, Edward Harwood Edward. is his name. And he wrote about in the, in the Journal of, um, of Gardens and Designed Landscapes, he wrote a lot, an essay, a really great essay about association this idea about reception because a lot of the time when people talk and I don't actually buy into it for example so but a lot of the time people will focus on this period by talking about in a way about reception theory how the gardens were received by visitors at the time and so reception theory is the main discourse of garden design literature which is to say they turned over here and suddenly they saw this 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 building and it reminded them of that story and then, but wait, they go to the next one and then they saw that story. And so in a way, a lot of it was, buy, this is buying into the kind of classist aspect of these things, which is you'd only appreciate this if you were educated in a proper way to know these stories. And so we'll talk more about this. And so I don't know them. And so a lot of the time I was walking instead picking up the tricks, like how they were working with the changes of direction um, the way that objects and topography, the objects were placed often either on the top of the, either they're bridges at the bottom or they were placed on the top as lookouts, the way that trees were framing views, the way that topography opens out, as I've been talking, those were the things that I found um, most interesting. And so, as I said, really I'm talking about this one first, and you, even though in terms of the timeline it's not the first, because of the fact that what we see is this transition of 
of Stowe from when it goes from being a, a Baroque garden to an entirely English landscape garden and how that transition and the breaking down of axes, the rustication of pools, the creation of other small spaces, etc. Um, and so you can really clearly see in this sort of the... Um, see here how these small op there's opens in openings between spaces where one gets out, sees part of this space, but you can't see that space until you get there and you move across, etc. So each of the time, openings, changings of direction in relationship to water. Now, this became a school in actual fact, and so Stowe has been a school for quite a long time and uh, um, really expensive private school, so it's probably not that different to what it was. So um, in terms of the, the person who I think is probably one of the most interesting from the period, I would say it was also um, William Kent. And I think that Kent is really... I mean, I think Bridgman is under, underrated and not often talked about enough because he has a hand in a lot of projects. And in actual fact, Kent, Bridgman and Kent, no, you know, Kent took over a lot of Bridgman's projects. And one of the most beautiful projects um, that, I, that I, mean, I can think of is ultimately this one called Rousham. And so Rousham, he is, again... This is um, the, the drawings for Rousham by Bridgman. So the main things to notice here is that we have a water body going along the bottom here. We have the house on the top of the slope up here. We have a sort of like a lawn or a pleasure ground that's the transition between. So we can see here the, the things that um, Walpole was analysing, which is the firm or knee, the ornamental farm out here, the sort of forest, which is the sort of picturesque landscape, the pleasure ground coming up to the building and then the sort of villa. And it's probably the pleasure ground and the building which are the most, have the most debt to the sort of French landscape. Now, if we look at what happened with this project when um, Kent was working on it, what we can see if we put the two next to each other is that here is the house... Um, let me just get this right. Here is the house up here, so that's definitely in place. We can see here that this series of water features that we had, that we saw here, which is this series is still in existence, but you can notice a general loosening of, of all the geometry around these and a kind of a, a removal of axiality uh, and a sort of opening up process. Now, if you go to that, to the landscape uh, now... It's, it's quite interesting to me because of the fact that it's a, it's really a, um, it gets a lot of landscape out of not a lot of space. And so a lot of the time the, the term charming would be used about this. So whenever you hear the term charming in landscape, it means not very big, but potentially well designed. So no one ever called Versailles charming because it's massive. But this is relatively a small garden all set on the side of a hill. So in, if we looked, if I talked to you guys about the Garden of So, where they had one axis that was quite small in that direction and a massive perpendicular parallel axis, a perpendicular axis, it's the same. So that even though the address of the building is off towards this, this larger landscape um, out here, so here's the building and there's that larger landscape, in actual fact, the garden itself is, is, quite, is just on a bank, really. And so you can see a lot of those, um, those transitions quite clearly in that, um, in that example. And so I'll walk through it for you. Now, next to the house, which is basically here, um, you see, and this is something that often that will persist, this is essentially and was, you know, originally is really the kitchen garden. And so the productive landscape was always associated with the house it was never generally... Or it was ornamentalised in a rough sort of way. And so when you see something like Aranyazak City Farm, where you've got the use of rosemary or plants like that on the edge of the vegetable bed, that's something that comes from the ornamental garden, the kitchen garden, which is next to the house. This is not a functional kitchen garden, but that's what this is. And it's often walled because it's utilitarian. And a lot of the time species, I heard Mark talking about, 
the use of marigolds, but a lot of the time there were companion planting species that were being used in relationship to that. The, com the configuration of it, the walling of it, is basically the French potager. And so this garden still, a lot of these places still have their kitchen gardens that are not gardens, etc., next to the house. And then once you, once you sort of, um, once you get to the house itself, you know, what you're really, let me just orientate myself, you know, the house, to enter the house, you go, these days what you, what you do is you, you go via the kitchen garden. And so the kitchen garden that I showed you is next to the house here. This axis originally would have been the actual main entry to the house, but because when we enter the house these days, we enter the house in a utilitarian way, we don't enter the house in a ceremonial way, you generally will enter through the kitchen garden because that's the way that the servants and tradespeople would enter the into the, the house and these ceremonial entries are now just lines like that like this and so once you cross through the other sign that's going through this this you then when you get to the other side of the house um, this is probably one of I was in my really crazy panorama period when I did this tour so for that I really apologize because um, now if I went back I was it was just so new and I thought it was awesome for landscape because you could see both ends of the... You could see the section in the picture, but in actual fact, it didn't... Just, it just meant that they were kind of crazy, uninterpretable sort of things. And so when you go to the house or leave the house, this is the sort of the main view from the house looking out across the landscape. Oh, no, that's looking the other way. Sorry. Sorry. Where am I? I'm lost. Yeah, let's go to the drawing. Let's go to the drawing. When you look across, so that's that's the kitchen garden, as I said, over here. And when you go to, to the sort of back of the house and look across this landscape, you have this this sort of lawn here that then looks across onto the larger landscape. And this is what that um, this is a sort of transition. Ah, oh yeah, there's my photo. This is what that transition looks like. And so, on the one hand you have this completely organised sort of, you know, rectilinear lawn in front of the house and then, and that's levelled so that when you're looking from here, you can see that landscape, but really all you see is this statue and then the landscape transposed against it. But when you get to the other side of that, you can then... Oh, don't do this to me. When you get to the other side of that, what you discover was, is this sort of landscape that it's linked to. And so the bank, if you think of the ha-ha as to put a, is to use topography to conceal an edge, here this edge of the lawn is like a, is like a, I used to call it a topographic waterfall, which is to say it's a point at which the topography transitions so that you just see the line of the horizon. You don't know what's beyond it until you get to that edge and then you get the larger... Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's not approved, okay, um, until you get the larger um, view. And so, um, as we move out of that landscape, uh, what happens is you then move through a series of smaller spaces. And those smaller spaces um, are quite important, and I'll sort of try to sort of wander through them. So, for example, you know, the one, one of the ones that's over here for example, is literally just a sort of a transition from um, where one has the edge of the creek down the bottom and they're these sort of like openings um, across the hill on your way down. And so, you know, and that's this slope. So all of these are along this slope. You know, another one here as you go along, so you're walking along the, the creek, is where you've got a transition between this sort of seating area which is never really for seating and then the creek along here so you kind of like you can move along here so you push through a band of vegetation into the next catchment behind or you can walk along the creek looking up and each time you push through a band of vegetation you then discover another you know there's another way through to the next one and so that for example in the next one one discovers like a this series of of smaller water features that were created originally by Bridgman, and so you know each one of them is a different um, a different sort of catchment we'd say, and so 
there's also, you know, one of the sort of really nice moments. Have I got another one? Let me show if I can find. Yeah, so this one here, this sort of earlier point here, is actually a series. This is the series that was produced by Bridgman that starts at, to this sort of this sort of spring coming up, and then it goes into another pond, and they basically they work their way down to the creek at the bottom ultimately, and so linking between that sort of water body that's got this series of steps, um, which are these ones through here, um, these ones through here, is this really charming sort of another pool that joins up with that. So, for example, it's, you know, that, that starts as this sort of um, meandering sort of water course that makes its way through to an intermediate sort of pond and then joins that other larger water body, which is that transition from here through to here. And so they're really getting a lot out of a small piece of land by using small valleys on the side of a hill that's then split up with vegetation and the circulation through. And I think this is one of the things that the picturesque park, as we might know it now, um, also, um, also has. <coughs> so... That's, that's Rausham. As I said, the main example, the main thing I want you to think about from this is the way that, that through utilising a series of small vistas and angles like this, what we're actually doing is we're getting a lot of spatial diversity in a small amount of real estate by going perpendicular, by crossing and crossing and crossing and crossing. This is the same strategy that we see in Park La Valette scheme this scheme by OMA where we have the bands and the circulation crossing it. So it's got some history, that sort of strategy. Yeah? Uh, you said that it had a really cool slope inside it. Like, you said the slope. Slope? Yeah. We Which have, did? Um, Russian. This is, but that's what I've been talking about the whole time. Oh, uh, okay. The whole thing. So this whole thing is the really... <laughs> that's, this whole thing is the slope. Okay. So that's all the slope. Okay. And so the slope goes through there. And each one of these little moments here is a part of that slope, buried in that slope. So this is one little gully going down. Does that make sense? This is a, these, are, these are more little gullies going down. All of them, that's another little gully that I'm looking up at now, going down. This is crossing the slope, for example. This is looking from this little one at the top down to the bottom. So you can see each of the time, that's like a little channel. So it's like in the diagram would be a whole lot of parallel slopes with vegetation in between that you walk along with the, with the top of a bank at the top, which is sort of ornamental, which is productive land. Mm -hmm. Productive land on the upper, other side of the creek at the bottom and then this, just this one strip in between. Um, so what I want to do now is I want to go into a little bit of theory for a second because I think that this is where it's quite important um, to talk about some of the theory in relationship to these three terms, which is the sublime, the picturesque and the beautiful. And so some of the readings that I put up, albeit late, but nonetheless something that you still have time to reflect upon for your next essay, um, you'll find some by a guy called Uvedale Price and another one um, you'll find Payne Knight, Price and Gilpin. And so uh, the order of them, I might move the order around a little bit and actually start with some of the theoretical aspects of this. And so... Um, and a lot of it comes down to um, the the writing of Edmund Burke um, and a sort of and his writing about um, aesthetics. And so you know, Burke really uh, wrote this book called *The Philosophical Inquiry into the Origins of Our Ideas of the Sublime and the Beautiful*. And so it's important to understand that this is a that 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 Burke was writing about um, a theoretical thing about aesthetics, really. And the two ways he defines it, and probably the easiest ways to define it, are that something is beautiful that is pleasing to the senses, and something is sublime when it's really about ideas. And so I'll use an example of this. And so the things that, um, that really... Um, uh, so, for example, a painting can be beautiful because it's pleasing to the senses. This is the, you have to situate this in the 1750s something or other. 
So in other words, we can look at it, we can say it's beautiful, we can say it's, you know, it's got certain qualities. And, you know, this is where, they, you know, people talk about the Oxford, it's got, you know, form, colour, all of these things, they're qualities for the eye, right? For admiration. Now, the sublime is something which is, for example, if we go to these definitions, there it's, it's awe, it's deep reverence, it's emotion, it's vast. And so a lot of the time, the sublime... Like if we looked at, you know, if we look at a big view from, you know, um, we look at a really big view out in the distance, that landscape of a wild landscape, we might say that's really sublime and it's sort of overwhelming. And so a lot of the time the, the sublime and the reason that's a, the reason that, that that's treated as an idea because of the fact that it's about, about scale and... It's overwhelming. We have to position ourselves in relationship to it. It's treated by, by Burke as an idea. And so, um, effectively then, the beautiful was about our senses of vision. So this is the way it was originally established. And so, the sublime was generally used as a term to describe, um, uh, to describe nature. And so, Kant, who went on to write about... Um, the sublime in particular, really um, talked about the idea that, that, um, that the sublime aesthetic was applied to nature only and that it provided a pure instance of aesthetic judgment. So there's a bit of a difference there between the two because ultimately, in a way, um, Kant is saying that nature is the original aesthetic, essentially. It's absolutely awesome in some sense and all the rest is created by by man, and therefore is the beautiful is something which is actually artificial in a sense, whereas the sublime is sort of natural. Now, so those are two terms that come up from, from um, Burke and then Kant. And so if we're looking at this more in terms of, of the picturesque, the picturesque is seen to be in the centre between those two, where we have the sublime as the wild, and we have the beautiful as the entirely, um, the entirely um, painted, organised, whatever, not painted, but the entirely sort of the beautiful object. The picturesque was seen to be in the middle and therefore it was largely about taste. Because at this particular point in time, in a way, that knife edge between the sublime and the beautiful was a knife edge of taste. And that taste was seen to be around landscape painting. And so you can't detach landscape, the English landscape garden from landscape painting, and particularly the paintings of Claude Lorraine or Poussin, um, people like this. And so, particularly Claude Lorraine. And so when they're talking about the picturesque, when, when, um, when Gilpin is talking about... Uh, the picturesque. A lot of the time, they're talking about operationalizing painting as a way of seeing. Operationalizing painting as a way of seeing. And so, what we mean by that is that instead of it being I'm looking at a painting, we're looking as if I am looking like a painting. No, I am. My way of looking is painterly. I'm picking up the landscape. I'm picking it up like a painting. And so people would talk about picturesque tours through Europe. So where they're saying they're looking at picturesque landscapes, but their way of looking is a picturesque way of looking at the landscape. So they'll settle on things that look like a painting and they'll move past those things that are either too beautiful and thought to be a bit twee, a bit too nice, and those things that are too wild to thought and thought to be a bit too natural. So they're positioning this moment of taste in between the two. And so, um, for example, uh, you know, for example, one thing that Uvedale Price talks about, which is interesting, is that he says here um, that what we're talking about, that, that the reason that we might, um, he says, we are, we are therefore to profit by the experience contained in pictures. So in other words, it's about the fact that some, the picturesque is about it looks like something that's in a picture. And the reason that is because they've had um, long periods of uninterrupted admiration 
um, and which have therefore have a similar claim to influence our judgment and to form our taste. So you can see it's about education. It's not about naturalness. It's not about the fact that every person has the ability to see a beautiful picture. It's the fact that people have been educated to know what things that are picturesque look like. And so therefore, he says, these are the reasons for studying copies of nature, despite the fact that the original is therefore before us. And so, in other words, they're saying it's a bit like what Baudrillard would call the simulacra, which is the copy is more real than the real thing. It's that nature is actually, the nature that would be painted would be better than the real nature, is effectively what they're, what they're saying. And so, interestingly, in that process, all of the discussions, there's big, there's big fights that go on after that. And the fights are really between Repton, who is... Um, uh, Repton, who is the... Uh, um, the sort of pupil, or not actually literal pupil, but the sort of people would say the copyist of, of um, Capability Brown and the, um, these guys, um, Payne Knight and Oovedale Price. Now, I'm going to go back to that in a second, and I'll look at another garden, and we'll get back to, um, to Repton in a second. But you get this transition of what I'm talking about, where the beautiful is seen to be... Um, too designed, too nice, too neat, too organised, which would have been therefore part of the... Well, I wouldn't have even thought the French garden was beautiful. It would be too ugly organised. The natural is seen to be too wild, therefore not having taste. The picturesque was seen to be like a painting and therefore having tastes, etc., etc. And those... I'll show you a little bit more about this in a second. And so this is another, probably one of the purest and best of these English landscape gardens before, um, before uh, Brown and Repton get on the scene. Um, and this is Henry Hoare's uh, Stourhead. And Stourhead, you know, I would have to say is a really, an amazing, um, an amazing place, largely because of its topography. And it has a whole lot of things that, are, um, that are sort of no important parts of the, the English landscape garden. The first of those things, which is odd, I have to say, is that one enters through this, this cute little town. And so this is where we're starting to see something which will come up more in terms of people like Repton. But in the picturesque, you could also have a picture of a lovely, a lovely village scene. And in the same way in a lovely village scene, um, you wouldn't necessarily like it to look exactly like it was a rough scene full of peasants, but it's more like actually a scene that's, that's kind of rustic and nice. And so, you know, these days you enter that landscape through this kind of like, it's a bit like a kind of a composed little village that you walk through. Now, if we think back to the French gardens, a lot of the time, you know, when men Marie Antoinette went down, um, you know, a lot of the time, you know, she had this miniaturised miniaturized little town that was made to be two-thirds scale with small people wandering around the place in the same sort of idea that it was kind of cute. So it tells you also how detached people are from working people, right, that they can objectify working people in that kind of way. So that's one element. Now, my PhD supervisor wrote quite a lot about the picturesque, and he wrote an essay, which is a really interesting essay on the butcher shop, and he talks about a painting from one of these treatises on aesthetics, I can't remember which one, where in the back of the picture is a butcher's shop of one of these little towns, with a dead carcass hanging in there. And there was quite a... And he talks about whether or not that carcass was in good taste according to those principles and whether or not it moved from the picturesque into the sublime because it was dripping red meat, effectively. And this boundary between the butcher... Is the butchery picturesque or is it too sublime, gory, whatever? And these are the kind of things about taste that people talked about. So you can also see when we get to the house... You can see things that are common, which are, you know we should recognise in this sort of quasi typology, which is the sort of pleasure grounds next to the house on one side, where we can start to see herbaceous borders creeping in, and this is something which will come back a bit later. 
And then on the other side of the house, though, we have the landscape which we can recognise from the, the sort of picturesque where, on the one hand, we don't have a ha-ha here to hide this fence. Nonetheless, the view is across an agricultural landscape. So we've gone from pleasure ground closest to the building to the view of the agricultural landscape. Now, inside that landscape, because of the drama of, you know, the drama of these... Um, the landscape, we can also see here the topography of it. You know, we can see that, that um, Stourhead has this sort of central lake in the centre and a series of branches that come off it. And, you know, again, we can recognise that bridge. That's the same bridge that we saw at Stowe. It's the same bridge that we saw at the end of uh, the same type of bridge. It's a Palladian kind of bridge. We can also recognise this sort of, a sort of villa here, which is also following on those principles, you know. And as we move up into the landscape, we can see, you know, more, more and more of these same moments. And so to somewhat, the bits where it gets interesting to me are once you start to move into the park itself. And when you move into the park, the follies start to gain some different sort of qualities. And so, for example, here we can see here is the entry into this grotto. And as you move into that grotto, it's revealed to be a sort of a an interior with light wells, and it's, I can honestly say that is one sp spooky, it is a spooky grotto, you know, and I think it's a, we can see the relationship of this to the Grand Tour and back to, you know, the, some of the things we saw, for example, the grottos that were, that were um, in Florence, that we saw um, in Florence, you know, and so it's a, it's a reference back to those things and those type of things. Also, you know, here we have out of context a kind of quasi-Gothic cathedral. So this we also have to recognise that the Gothic revival is on its way back up again in this period. So to some extent, the parts that are most interesting about it is how in this diagram we see the use of um, these water bodies that and these valleys that move their way up off that central that central water body. And so as you move up the hill, finally, you know, one of the pits that I found sort of nicest was at the very top of the, of the sort of landscape, and this sort of moves its way through and out. You know, we have this sort of moment here, and we also see something which you'll see in the 19th century landscapes and gardens of um, Central Park and Olmsted, where you have the way that they were very interested in the way that the forest met the lawn, and where the forest seems to, the lawn sort of goes up and under, and the forest sort of meets it in that way. And so they were particularly enamoured with these kind of edges. Um, and so while each of these were, in a way, coming from people who were amateurs, who were artists or, you know, architects, or even though architecture in the sense didn't exist in the same way, or um, gentle people, um, probably one of the first... Uh, practitioners who was working in landscape gardening, and I would make the claim that, in fact, you can easily make it, that landscape architecture as we know it now comes from landscape gardening, which is what it was at that time, because ultimately Repton's work, there was a book written by, um, by Paxton about Repton's work, which was called The Landscape Architecture of Humphrey Repton. And so Repton was a fan of capability brown, and so you can ultimately argue that that's the way that we ended up with landscape architecture is via landscape gardening. And in my book that I make, I've got coming out at the moment, I make a case for returning to landscape gardening. Um, but interestingly, you know, if we're looking here, we can see, we can start to see that transition between um, between the beautiful and the... Um, and the picturesque and the, uh, the sublime. And so, for example, this here, which is uh, a particular sort of... This scene here would be seen to be too beautiful um, by Payne Knight, whereas this one is closer to the sublime because it resembles the work of Claude Lorraine. And so... Um, uh, if we want to talk about that quickly, one of the things that's quite interesting is that Price, Uvdal Price and Richard Payne Knight, both of them are very critical of um, Capability Brown. And they basically, like it's fair to say, they just absolutely shit-can the guy. And so 
um, the, the thing that they, they say, and you can sort of see in this picture here, was that um, uh, you know, for instance, they say the, you know, you know, the description of paradise seems to have been copied from some piece of modern gardening. That such a man, as in the person who's copying it, full of enthusiasm for this new art and with little veneration for that of painting, should choose to show the world that Claude Lorraine might have been, um, what the Claude Lorraine might have been had he the advantage of, of seeing the works of Mr. Brown. Um, having been accustomed to whiten all distant buildings, those of Claude's from the effect of his soft, vapory atmosphere would appear to him too indistinct. The painter, of course, would be more ordered to give them a smarter appearance. And later on he says, there is not a person in the smallest degree conversant with painting who would not, at the same time, be shocked and diverted at the black spots and the white spots, the naked water, the naked buildings, the scattered, unconnected groups of trees, and all the gross and glaring violations of every principle of the art. And yet this, without any exaggeration, is in the method in which many scenes worthy of Claude's pencil have been improved. And so this is where, you know, we can say that, and when we talk about Claude um, Lorraine, how am I going to do this? Uh, let's just find some Claude Lorraine for the fun of it. Untainted landscape and the picturesque is when the human element lay in it that wasn't controlled. I mean, there's a, that's, is that what you learned at, at, yeah, at more, it Might have actually been. I mean, mostly it is interesting. I mean, I think that there is, there is, that's one way you can talk about it. For instance, I'll talk in a second about what Robert Smithson had to say about the picturesque yeah. because there's quite a lot of variation in that. I mean, I think you could, you could make that argument, definitely, but I think that, that, um, I think a lot of the time, it, this thing about being being civilized was to say that that um, is. I mean, I, I think my take around it is around taste. I have to say, but I think it does does go that that way. And so, if we just just want to have a look for a second at a a picture here of of a Claude Lorraine image. Um, You were just with me for a second, and now you're gone again. Oh, that's a great picture. Um, but you get the idea. And so when, when, when they're talking, you know, look at that bridge. What a surprise. We've seen that bridge at least twice in two other gardens, right? And so when you're looking at those trees, you know, what we're talking about, when he says that, He's talking about white spots and black spots. What he's talking is that, in a way, the clump of trees, which if we go to here, you'll see there is the clump of trees, whereas for him, Lorraine, Claude Lorraine would have painted those trees. You would never have a clump of trees separated. You would have had trees as a gradient into each other from, you know, in that way. And so similarly, you would always have had you wouldn't have had the building sitting on its own. You would have had an overlap between the building and the vegetation. And, you know, so, for example, you know, if we're looking at... Let's find some more. You know, if we're looking at, at something like that, we can see that, that the way that the building sits in the landscape, the landscape has this edge of fuzziness to it. And, indeed, Price says, according to the idea that I have formed, intricacy in landscape might be defined as that exposition of objects which, by a partial and uncertain concealment, excites and nourishes curiosity. So, uncertain concealment and a partial concealment. And so it's that thing where being critical about, about the landscapes of um, Brown was the fact that Brown would have, here's, the skull, here's that building sitting right at the middle, at the end of the axis with the, the trees coming behind it. It's white, then there's the, you know, clean, 
Whereas this sort of rustication was what the of the picturesque was what Payne Knight um, and Price were talking about. And then it, you know a key term here is variety. Variety can hardly require a definition, though from practice of many layers out of the ground, which is obviously brown and repton, one might suppose it did. So obviously they're always arguing for variety. Upon the whole, it appears to me that as intricacy in this disposition and variety in the forms, the tints, the lights, the shadows of objects are the great, great characteristics of picturesque scenery. So monotony and baldness are the greatest dis, um, defects of improved places. So if the criticism there of brown is the opening up of all of this grass, the groups of trees, that's this criticism. He says, picturesqueness, therefore, appears to hold a station between beauty and sublimity, and on that account perhaps is more frequently and happily blended with them both than they are with each other. So that's this transition between the picturesque, the, 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 blue, the beautiful, which is the, the cultural effectively, and the natural as the sublime. And it is, however, perfectly distinct from either. And first, with respect to beauty, it is evident from all that's been said that they are founded on very opposite qualities. Beauty, he says, the one on, on smoothness, the other on roughness, which is therefore um, the sublime. The one on the gradual, the other on the sudden variation. The one idea on ideas of youth and the other and freshness, the others on ideas are even decay. And so, you know, this is the gradient you're playing is this middle zone between these two. Okay, and so... If we look at an example, and it's one that I showed you guys before quickly, so I won't go into it in that much depth, but a cl sort of classic example of, um, of a brown landscape would be Petworth House. And so a lot of the time, the landscapes that I've been looking at were landscapes that were in where, where, um, where Brown did some work after Kent, mostly. And so this is one that Brown did on his own. And so obviously one of the key sort of aspects, and I showed you this before, was that the pleasure ground by this stage is almost completely gone. And so when we look at the look at the house, the house is now meeting directly into the landscape. We no longer have the pleasure ground that we used to have as a transition between the house and the landscape. They meet each other, you know, that's seamlessly they meet each other. You know, we have here, this is where, for example, a lot of, you know, another guy who was a really big fan of, um, of Brown talked about the fact that the, um, his name was Gilpin. And when he talks about the, um, the kind of key things about the, um, uh, the, the forest scenery that he talks about, what he really talks about is also that, the, that, um, we shall expect that all offensive trumpery and all the rough luxuriance of undergrowth should be removed unless where it is necessary to thicken or connect a scene or hard, hide some startling boundary. You know, so in other words, that, that this is the kind of group of trees that, for example, um, Brown was producing but was very much the opposite to what Uvedale Price or Knight would have suggested. And so this is that, set, this is that group of trees on this hill up here. As we move through that landscape, you know, we also notice that there is, um, and I mean, I must admit, you know, that's a very, you know, it's a very beautiful thing unto itself, but the signs of the landscape in a way being designed start to, you know, we move into this, this scene where it's not a, where we're so conditioned to that potentially being a natural scene that we probably think it looks like a natural scene and probably actually looks a bit like savannah, to be honest with you. But... In actual fact, you know, for English forests, etc. Hey, can you guys turn your things down? Hello, YouTubers. Yeah. Um, and so, and so, when you, if you're looking at that landscape, this kind of curvature and arrangement of it, these are these odd trees that that Payne Knight and Uvedale Price can't stand, for example. The, the, you know, the, the way that the landscape is organised, it's full of fallow deer, as you saw in my article. So it's, it's effectively a game, a game landscape, you know, and that's, the, that's how it's manipulated. And as I say, this is the language of the public park that came out of the 19th century. So you guys don't seem to have as many of these types of parks as we would 
in Australia, but even in the 20th century, a lot of parks, colonial parks, were laid out in this kind of principle. Now, if you go to Munich, Munich has, a, has an English garden in the centre of Munich that looks just like this, because ultimately Central Park made this the language. Because Olmsted visited these places, he brought this back as the language that, that sort of operationalised the picturesque in planning, which is what happened in the 19th century. Now, when we move on to Repton, yeah. No, it's Mr. Do you know Marine to Dan in Joseph? Yeah, I've seen it. It's probably exactly that kind of thing. It's very much yeah. like that. And it's got like a rose garden to the one side. Yeah. And then the rest of it is like, it looks exactly like this. Mm. It's like these rolling hills with these trees. It's the kind of, it's, and in the 20th century, it became, it also became manageable because you could attach a tractor, you could put a, a mower on the back of a tractor, and you could mow the hell out of it. You know, it didn't require any garden beds. The trees were established. It was the lowest maintenance big landscape you could produce. So where there was water available, it became really common. Um, <clears throat> now, this guy, Humphrey Repton, was a follower of, of um, Brown. And so, you know, this is, I always think this is interesting because by now we do have a profession, right? Humphrey Repton, landscape gardener, that's his business card. And so this is where we now have, that's, the, that's prob you know, probably one of the earliest business cards for a landscape architect you could find. And so it's, it's, you know, it's very well established in that sense. And, and Repton is very well known for, for his, um, his red books. And the red books were books that, um, that he used with his clients that described the um, before and after effectively, of the, um, you know, of the landscape. And so if you can imagine we've got this gradient between the sublime, the beautiful and the picturesque, we've now got a transition here where, where you know, brown was too beautiful, you know, where some people thought that brown was picturesque but others thought it wasn't rough enough. But then, in a way, Repton was even finer than... Brown. So here we have a landscape that some people might have regarded as, as picturesque, actually, at the time. But then Repton had modified it like this. And if you look at what Repton was doing, you can see that there's a massive topographic change happening here to open this up. We have this sort of picturesque trail go down here. We have the house built in that location just there. You know, we've obviously got the view of that landscape. So that those, that we still want to have those cows and stuff because that's part of the picturesque scene. But effectively, they've opened up this entire lower landscape by excavating this hill to open that up, uh, the side of this hill. And so, for example, that's, that's actually... I mean, that's, that's my own photo when I visited this, uh, this place. And what you can see, you can still see a lot of the, the stuff that you can recognise from... Brown as you enter, as you come close to that landscape, which is the way that the building sits in amongst that that landscape and that kind of roughness of it. And, you know, there's the there's the house, etc. And so, to some extent, the hard part for me um, with them is that that ironically for me there was something actually quite sublime about this landscape, and that's kind of what I liked about it. There's a scale of that sort of the idea that landscape designers are working with that sense of the landscape that's that big, it's almost, again, it's a kind of almost like a Versailles scale, but then it's like Versailles that disappears itself, I think is quite incredible. So ultimately what we're looking at now is the transition between, between the sort of period that's often called the picturesque and what's often known as the gardenesque. And so we're, in, we're firmly in the 19th century by now. And so in the 19th century... What you've got is you've got uh, one thing that's been happening in the 18th century is that you've got massive plant movement as a product of colonisation. And so as colonisation occurs, plants start moving around the world. And I've been I've written about a number of those plants. There's one plant that is called, uh, you know, Mirabilis jalapa, which is known as the... Um, um, the jewel of Peru, and Mirabilis jalapa got, gets discovered by Columbus in in uh, Europe, 
well, not in Europe, and in the Americas, in Mexico, actually. And then within 100 years, it had naturalized itself on the, the coast of Africa, on an island, to the point where it was recollected by a naturalist on this island and taken back to Europe to say, what is this? And they said, oh, that's... So that's this plant. And it had come to Cape Town within the 50 years earlier than that and managed to be moved and traded its way all the way through Africa. You know, so plant movement is part of this period. Um, so, and, and really at that time, we, if we think about the political and economic situation of the Whigs, um, even though we're, we're criticising the... Um, I was criticising the Whigs and the, the industrialisation process, the Industrial Revolution caused massive migration to the cities. It also created a, a, a boom in the middle classes. And so, in a sense, essentially, as the middle classes expanded, suburbia increased. As suburbia increased, um, in actual fact, uh, the, as suburbia increased, also people had access to land. Now, I've realised that I've missed something very important here, which was in the reading I gave you. And so I'm going to jump back to make sure it's actually mentioned in here, which is to say all of the landscape garden movement, as much as the Whigs themselves were liberals, the people who had the land spade, the landscapes through acts of enclosure, do you remember I wrote about this? Through acts of enclosure were actually excising the commons to make their landscapes appear bigger. And so even though the Whigs were liberal, their land practices were actually appropriative of the commons and exploitative of the commons. And so it's just an important thing to recognise. And so part of that also is the development of real estate speculation increasing, increasing the size of the uh, middle class. Now, as those plants came in, notably from places like China, would be, a, would be probably one of the biggest, also America, Africa as well, um, you know, Asia... Those plants also, and we also have a kind of point where the printing press and the middle class, basically we're talking about plant catalogues, the development of the gardening industry. And so off the back of the picturesque, we have the development of the gardenesque because of the fact that every suburban person wanted to have a garden. And they were access, had access to gardening, you know, not Bunnings, but they had access to plant catalogues where they could get plants that had been collected throughout the world in a way that had never been able to happen previously. And so with that, for example, some of the things that... One of the famous things that's, that was, you know, was the crystal, part, the crystal Palace in Hyde Park. And so also with this is, you know, steel technology and the creation and the manipulation of microclimate. And so, for example, the creation with Industrial Revolution comes the creation of glass houses, the ability to moderate environments, to grow plants in places that they previously did not naturally glow, grow, a process that, that was called acclimation. And so you can see here when you look at the plan for, um, which was designed by Paxton for Crystal Palace in Hyde Park, you can see here the, on the one hand we have and this is a fair sense of the nature of what's happening in design at the time. We have the Crystal Palace on axis with um, a grand central walk. And this is the, effectively the kind of neo-baroque, by this time the kind of Beaux-Arts aspect. And then as we move out of that, we have the picturesque aspects of the picturesque landscape. So we can see how... Those two are coming back together. Um, and then we have start to see things like this, which is essentially garden beds, creation of garden beds and displaying of plants um, in, in arrangements. And so that's something that Paxton, as an entrepreneur and a writer and one of the earliest gardeners, uh, garden writers who are writing for a suburban audience, was involved with. And so here, one of his major design projects is this rock garden um, that's at Chatsworth, and, you know, to some extent we can see how, you know, it's, it's in no sense is it natural, and we can see some of the kind of... Um, there's a kind of slightly picturesque a aspect to this, insofar as we can start to see some of the sort of landscapes 
that we might have seen through the, the grotto, etc. But also there starts to become a real interest in collecting um, alpine plants and um, you know, creating rockeries and some of the garden typologies that, were, that have become much common since then. And so this process is really a process, what I've been trying to show is a sort of like a, a process of transition between the, the sort of Baroque landscape that was in England in the, the 17th century, how the transition and into that through, through Bridgman, Kent, and then the, the practice of landscape gardening through Brown and Repton to the kind of commercialisation of gardening in the Gardenesque um, through Paxton um, and the use and incorporation of industrial technology through Whig entrepreneurs who had actually also been involved in things like Stowe. Okay, so now that's the kind of end of the, of the English tradition in terms of, of the Gardenesque, but in the 20th century... The next sort of major stage would have to do with something that has become known as, uh, that became known as the cottage garden, but was really the arts and crafts garden. And so we're talking about the English landscape garden here, and this is not part of the English landscape garden, but it is the, the next sort of sequential thing. And so, you know, t these two writers um, were garden writers, and so if we're talking about Paxton, Paxton was writing guidebooks about how to garden, histories, a whole lot of stuff. For a commercial audience. Gertrude Jekyll was writing how-to books about how to produce vegetable gardens and Sackville West by this stage had made her name as a, as a, a major gardener of, um, um, uh, of the sort of Sunday papers and things like that. Now I'm not going to talk hugely about the garden design methods of Gertrude Jekyll because of the fact that when I give a lecture for you in planting design I'll talk specifically and in great amounts of detail about how she designed her planting design arrangements. But, you know, Gertrude Jekyll was interesting because, you know, she was a gardener largely and she was a kind of, a, you know, sort of real matron and really a plants person. And she had a, a relationship with, um, with uh, architects, you know, that, were, that was very strong and in particular Edward Lutyens. <clears throat> And Lutyens was a major arts and crafts uh, architect. And this is Hestercombe House. Hestercombe House is, a, is one of the more intact and beautiful, very beautiful landscape of, um, uh, uh, of, of Jekylls. And it's also interesting because, of course, behind it, there is also actually an English landscape garden. And so a lot of these places, if we think of a transition... There's a process in the 20th century of ripping out the English landscape gardens and creating these, these arts and crafts gardens. And the features, the kind of features of them that you can see, you know, we can recognise some things that come from the, um, that come from the history of the uh, Italian garden in terms of, you know, we've got the use of terraces, we've got really... Um, you know, they're, they're, they're highly formal in a sense of how they're designed and a lot of the geometry of them becomes complex in the overlays of orders like crosses and squares and crosses and squares and axes linking into axes. We have the use of garden rooms as a really major feature of them and the use of planting to demarcate garden rooms. We can also recognise the influence of the cloister gardens, the walled gardens with the knot in it. So obviously we have the medieval garden with a, with a knot which comes and moves in to become with the influence of the arabesque um, in the parterre. And then we also see that in the arts and crafts garden returning. And so as part of the arts and crafts tradition, you know, we can see this as in a way a, a, a sort of a, an interest in returning to that, um, to that tradition. And so part of this is also if we look at um, this period and pre-Raphaelite painting, an interest in, in folklore, um, and so, in a way, a return to the, me to, to the medieval as a parody of itself. Um, and a lot of these gardens, when you look at them, you know, we can, I think we can assume that, that Lutyens designed a lot of the, the landscape, but, but the work, the quality of the, the stonework uh, in the projects is extremely, extremely beautiful in how it's, it's worked. And you can see that it's really still about 
some level of theatre of moving from one place to another place. The use of the perennial border. And so if you compare that the English landscape garden, you would never have worked on how these spaces here were actually... Um, you know, the scale of this is so different to the scale of the English landscape garden. While you might have, in the, in the, in the kitchen garden next to the house, you might have had a, um, something like this where you'd have companion planting around and some ornamentalisation around the kitchen garden, which I should add is the most common thing you'd see anywhere. As I said, you'll see the same in... Um, in the Amazon, which is an ornamentalization of the of the of the vegetable garden, you'll see the same in the French um, the French potager, and you'd see the same in um, you know the Eastern Cape garden. And so, you know, that's not an uncommon thing. But to, this is in a way uh, domestic scale that comes from that kitchen garden. That's now the display of the garden, much more intimate. Also, a kind of theming of colour, um, etc. And so still the uses of water, still all of those features, still very much focused around the house. Um, but this transition here between, between the house on one side and the gardens and then the landscape of the, the farm landscape on this side, effectively utilising this like it's a ha-ha, that is a straight-up pleasure garden kind of relationship. So you could say... Some of this is a return of the pleasure garden in a much more gardened uh, way. Things like, there's lots of planting stuff which we'll talk about in terms of the use of ground covers and a whole lot of stuff. But as I say, we'll discuss that in the planting design lecture. Now, <clears throat> Jekyll also um, influenced highly Vita Sackville West. And Vita Sackville West um, and her husband... Um, Harold Robertson, I think is Harold, Harold, Harold Nicholson, Nicholson, Harold Nicholson. So long as he's not the guy who sold out to Hitler and killed himself for the Second World War, I can never remember. <laughs> so if, if it's, it might be the wrong Harold. But anyway, so, so um, Vita Sackville West, this is a, they're an, interesting, an interesting, um, interesting relationship they had and I think, you know, you have to discuss it because it's part of their nature. Um, and it also reminds me of, I don't know if any of you guys have picked up at the moment, but in Australia, at the moment, there is a really big furore happening around, around gay marriage in Australia at the moment. And, of course, you know, South Africa has been ahead of, of most of, you know, a lot of the rest of the world for 20 years now, in that, in that, and there's a postal vote happening about this. And one of the arguments that the No campaign is making is that people who are raised by gay people are somehow messed up by having been raised by gay, gay people. But in actual fact, these two are a testament to, uh, to how solid a family structure that can be made of two people who are, who are co-parents and friends. And so both of these two, they, they were a, a gay couple who were effectively in a marriage of convenience who were also best friends. And so... Um, they also had a number of kids who they reared together. Um, Vita lived in, in this tower here and he lived in the house. The kids sort of moved, they hung out between and they created this garden, Sissinghurst, between them. And it's a, it's a really extraordinary, um, a really extraordinary garden. And I think that, that one of the... And, and it's also a garden that brought in something... Um, which is now really common in gardening, which is a sort of anecdotal, personal, diaristic writing about gardens. And so while previously garden writing in the 18th century had been about the Grand Tour and where there'd been a lot of treatises written about how to create landscape gardens, um, of which Paxton had also written one, by the time we're in the 20th century, gardeners were writing about gardens in, a, in diaries that they were publishing. And we'll recognise this now. If you go to newspapers and look on, and you go on a Sunday generally or maybe a Monday, you open it up, there's always somebody who writes a gardening column. And they'll say, start by saying something like, spring has come to my gardens. I started to notice this. This reminded me of this. Blue is the colour of such and such. Or I was feeling sad. I noticed this. So this is something that Vita Sackville West really, as a writer, um, 
sort of developed and it's also something that, that came out of treating the garden as a laboratory and it's something we've talked about in relationship to Bell Marx. So if you look from the top of the tower, you can quite clearly see how, how a lot of the focus of, of this, of working with this landscape was about the creation of garden rooms. And so on the one hand, we have topiary, which we know topiary or hedging like this is something which, which um, definitely Italian gardens had, but which you would have to say was associated a lot a lot with um, with the French garden, since the you know by the English garden, the English in the English garden, cutting plants was seen to be anathema, and a lot of the time the English gardeners had a real go at this idea that the French had to cut everything and control everything and keep everything under check. And so the fact that we've got the the hedge as the shaper and the container for garden rooms is something that. Um, I think has came out of the arts and crafts and the cottage tradition. And also the idea that each garden might have a kind of, um, might have a, a sort of planting theme was also something that came out of this period. Where a lot of it, you know, where each garden, you know, was based around certain sorts of colour palettes, um, based around certain sorts of habits, where we start to see things like the use of greys, grey plants, etc. But as I say, I'll talk to you a lot more in the um, uh, in the planting design lecture about those kind of things. Um, also, the sort of yeah. Where's the maze come from? Oh, the maze has got a very long history, and one of which I don't know a lot about. But I encourage you to write one of your five hundred word pieces about the maze. Um, but the maze has got a long history. And so, you know, I think that you'll find mazes all over the place. Um, but one of the things, I mean, this is part of my documentation here that I found most interesting is that, and I'm always on the lookout for the thing that strikes me that I wouldn't have immediately picked up, was around how the passages and transitions between one garden space and another garden space operated. Because in a way, the part of the... Part of the landscape architecture is around how you work with those transitions and thresholds. So, for example, when you don't have, you know, when you don't have enough space, you use a lot of perimeter. Which is to say, on the one hand, if you've got two compartments and you walk through one and you walk through the other, what's the other way of managing that to create a longer transition? It's to create another compartment between two garden rooms to put a passage between them effectively, to thicken it out so to get, rather than just crossing from this one to this one, you actually walk along one edge of this one, turn the corner and pop into that one, when you could have just probably walked straight through. And so you increase the, the length of the transition despite the fact that you don't have as much space as you might like. Also, th little things like how these walkways overlap. And so once, the, once past the hedge here, the overlap of this path into the lawn of the next one, the sequencing through the, cur the arches, etc. The way that you put a path to enter a space at an end, rather a centre, to turn you to look inside. All of these are the kind of tricks that you will see with um, projects like the work of Gilles Clément at um, Parc André Citroën. You know, this project, these sort of tricks, uh, I think, have a lot in a way, the cottage garden work of Jekyll and Sackville West and a lot of the others is actually has had a big influence on people who are interested in plants in other landscape traditions. That view there is probably the most famous view and I took it because I, my mother introduced me to Vita Sackville West. Of course, I was a kid. I was completely uninterested in gardens at that time. Um, but, you know, this view here of the tower where Vita Sackville West lived across this sort of wild cacophony of plants. Um, and also an interest in plant form, um, you know, was something that she was very interested in. Now, if we put all of those, if we consider those landscapes in relationship to this, we have to understand that, but that during the period of Paxton, we have an enormous um, assimilation of plants from all around the world. And so in a way, we couldn't have just had this type of movement of plants, while there was an interest, um, you know, in a way this type of planting arrangement could only happen once we had an enormous body of perennials, 
once we had an enormous body of, of roses from China and you know, rhododendrons and azaleas and all of those plants that are so common now. If we hadn't, I'm not, this is not at all a selling point for colonialism, it's just a recognition that plant trade comes out of that, that this type of pr approach, the arts and crafts garden and the interest in the perennial border, arises out of that plant trade. Yeah. Why do you call it an arts and crafts garden? Well, obviously, arts and crafts is a historic, is a is an art historical movement. Okay, so it's you know, like this kind of garden came out from people. <clears throat> it did, and so and so, you know, if we look at people like Ruskin, um, Robinson, garden writers like Robinson, William Morris, all of those that interest in making that came out of the arts and crafts, okay. and so it's also tied to, for instance, socialism. So the rise of English socialism was also tied to the arts and crafts. And so if you can imagine the rise of industrialisation happens, and so everything's mass-produced, what happens after everything's mass-produced? You want things that are bespoke, handmade, crafted. And so as a reaction to the arts and the reaction to the Industrial Revolution, we have the arts and crafts movement. As a response to the working conditions, the appalling working conditions of the worker in the Industrial Revolution, who's just running a machine going, chick chink, chick chink, chick chink. They've lost their skill. What do you, what would we, what should we do? We should respect them as craftspeople. So the arts and crafts is also about celebrating making, I, I can see you, and pulling all of that together. Yeah. Yeah. An interest in the floral as well. So there was a lot of that. You know, this, that, there's a lot of that sort of brodery um, knotting. There is an organic quality to it, it's true. Now, what's also interesting... Yeah? So, you know, it's like, if you say it has an interest in, like, how it's preparing for personal goods, like, that's where I'm just going to go the brand being larger than anyone. No, I mean, I think, you know, this is where what they would say is yeah. that before the Industrial Revolution, people yeah. were artisans all the time. Yeah. And so you can't, in a way, they were reacting to something that hadn't happened as badly as it's happened now. Because during this, pe this time, people were still, you know, having milk delivered in bottles and having everything given to them in paper bags. They hadn't yet got to the point of packaging, etc. So it was still, relative to how it is now, it's nothing. Um, so, yeah. Um, I'm just going to, before I finish, I just want to plot the other thing. Another the final thing about this is that... By the time we get to this period, Jekyll and Sackville West, there's also a return to an interest in things like books on English roses and English things. And so after the kind of globalisation that happened during the plant collecting period of colonisation, the English and the home custom of England was also being celebrated against these kind of invader plants. And so this is also a period where we start to have the rise of the natural garden um, which was another period that came out of this, so that when you go to the US, at the same period of time as this, this is where people like Jens Jensen are utilising arts and crafts, languages of construction, that might be like this, um, with indigenous plants that was happening in the UK. Now, the final thing, if I was putting another slide in here, which I would, and I will, and I would talk, will talk about in my lecture that I give on planting design, we have to also include in the 20th century, moving on from this, the movement and the rise of the perennial garden through people like James Hitchmau, the work at um, the work that's happened in relationship to uh, um, to landscape management in the UK, uh, a lot of it to do with indigenous plants and the use of gardening techniques to manage landscapes that's been happening at the University of, she of Sheffield. And so, thanks very much. That is the end of our lecture today, but I have something else to talk to you about, so just let me shut this baby down.